On May 23, 2014, hundreds of black luxury cars and thousands of New York City residents gathered on the streets of New York to mourn a Chinese woman. The last time a Chinese person in America had such a grand funeral was the martial arts legend Bruce Lee. In the funeral photo, the deceased appeared to be a middle-aged woman with simple clothing, short hair, and a slightly plump figure, resembling many hard-working immigrant mothers. However, in reality, she was a powerful figure in the underworld. Zheng Chuiping, known as the mother of snakeheads and the queen of smuggling, was seen by many as cunning, ruthless, solely driven by profit, disregarding human life, colluding with gangs, and resorting to violence to collect debts from those who couldn't afford smuggling fees. Yet, there were others who insisted she was an outstanding female entrepreneur, a philanthropist, a heroine who saved the suffering. So, was she an innocent victim or thoroughly corrupt? What led to such drastically different evaluations of this woman named Zheng Kuiping? Zheng Kuiping was born on January 9, 1949, in Shengmei Village, Tingjiang Town, Fuzhou City, Fujian Province, a village known by another name, Smuggling Village. The history of emigration in this village can be traced back to the late Qing Dynasty when waves of laborers embarked on voyages across the ocean heading to the legendary Land of Gold in America. However, with the tightening of anti-Chinese laws and immigration regulations in North America at the time, emigration for work gradually turned into smuggling and jobs shifted from railroad construction and gold panning to chopping vegetables and washing dishes in restaurants and hauling goods in grocery stores, ultimately remaining within the lower class of manual labor. Despite this, earning money was still better than fishing income in the small fishing village, so the villagers continued to follow suit. Zheng Chuiping's father was also among them. He jumped ship from a New York dock as a seaman and then worked as an undocumented laborer in Chinatown. He would then send money back home through an underground money exchange operated by fellow Fujianese. Zheng Kuiping's childhood and adolescence were spent waiting for her father's remittances and reading letters ghostwritten for him, filled with descriptions of America as a place where life was good and money was plentiful, fueling a deep longing for that distant land. This yearning persisted, even after her father was arrested by immigration authorities and deported back to China. Many in the village spent their lives caught in a cycle of smuggling, deportation, re-smuggling, and deportation again. A saying became popular in the village, as long as the sea doesn't dry up, smuggling won't cease. In the early 1970s, in her early 20s, Zheng Kuiping married a young man from a neighboring village, Zhang Yide. Pregnant with her first child, she moved to Hong Kong with her husband. Despite only having a primary school education, Zheng Kuiping was sharp-minded, quick with numbers, and a natural-born businesswoman. Within a few years, she became the owner of three grocery stores and invested in factories back in mainland China, appearing to be a highly successful entrepreneur. However, she still yearned for her American dream. Because her children were still young, she arranged for her husband to smuggle into the United States first. However, her husband also fell victim to being caught and deported, returning to Hong Kong two years later, blacklisted by immigration authorities. So, Zheng Kuiping tried various legitimate immigration routes to the United States, but all failed at the visa stage because Smuggling Village had a notorious reputation with immigration authorities. Individuals like Zheng Kuiping, with low education, and immediate family members with deportation records were directly denied visas. Even so, Zheng Kuiping did not give up. She persuaded an American couple who came to her shop to help her secure a full-time nanny work visa by guaranteeing sponsorship. This time, she finally got the opportunity to interview with the visa officer. When asked why she wanted to give up her comfortable life and go to a foreign country to care for someone else's children, Zheng Kuiping gave a perfect answer. America is a highly civilized country, a place where hard work can lead to rewards and dignity. I hope to work hard and provide a better life for my children in the future. This sincere, or perhaps well-rehearsed, response moved the visa officer, and Zheng Kuiping finally obtained her work visa. On November 17, 1981, she finally set foot on the long-awaited land of the United States of America. Of course, she was not going to be a straightforward nanny. After paying compensation to her sponsor employer, she headed straight to New York's Chinatown. With Zheng Kuiping's diligence, she quickly thrived in Chinatown and resumed her grocery store business. Then, through family reunification, she brought her husband and children over as well. 
Many immigrants would settle for running their own small businesses like their predecessors, working hard and using their remaining energy and time to educate their children, hoping that the next generation would integrate more successfully into American society. But Zheng Kuiping was different. She believed why wait for the next generation to earn money when she could do it herself. By the mid-1980s, smuggling into the United States saw a golden age, and in Zheng Kuiping's Fuzhou region, smuggling became increasingly rampant in some villages. Thus, assisting migrants in smuggling became a lucrative business, with the market price for each migrant being $18,000. In the eyes of the snakeheads, helping migrants smuggle was even more profitable than drug trafficking, because migrants not only volunteered, but also endured various dangers and hardships during the journey, and would evade the police and run away upon reaching their destination, making it highly lucrative. For migrants who lacked the money, snakeheads would also provide high-interest loans. When they finally paid off these debts through work, they couldn't open bank accounts due to their illegal status, so they had to use underground money exchanges to send money back to China. With her sharp mind and relentless pursuit of wealth, Zhang Kuiping naturally didn't miss this opportunity. Evidence shows that she had started the smuggling business as early as the early 1980s. Most of her early clients were relatives, friends, and neighbors from her hometown of Shengmei village. She preferred young boys, reasoning that they were in good physical condition and could endure the months-long journey even when cramped in a container at sea. More importantly, if they were caught and were under 18 with no legal guardian in the United States, deportation would involve more complex procedures and longer processing times. In other words, these young people not only had more years to work, but also had a chance of encountering luck, such as changes in immigration laws or presidential pardons, allowing them to stay in the United States permanently. As for the psychological impact of leaving home at a young age and embarking on such a risky journey, it was the least of concerns for snakeheads like Zheng Kuiping. However, for these migrants, their imagined better days did not begin as soon as they successfully smuggled into the United States. In the years, even decades after successfully smuggling, they had to work hard in black labor to repay the high interest loans for smuggling fees. If they dared to default or secretly run away and get caught, they could face severe beatings or even amputation. In the hands of these underworld figures, their fate was far more tragic than being caught and deported by immigration authorities. However, even so, it couldn't stop the tide of smuggling. At the time, there was a saying that a year's worth of earnings from cutting broccoli in Chinatown restaurants exceeded the income from 10 years of fishing in small fishing villages. Building a small house for the family in two years and achieving a modestly affluent life in three years this high-risk, high-reward proposition was indeed validated in this line of work. Yet, among these underworld figures, compared to those who were solely driven by profit, ruthless, and lacked integrity, Zheng Kuiping was considered a conscientious businesswoman. Her smuggling operations not only had a high success rate, but also provided certain guarantees for her clients. For example, if a smuggling attempt failed, they could try a different route again. And in the worst-case scenario, such as accidents or sudden illnesses, leading to the death of a migrant during the journey. Although the usual practice was to dispose of the body at sea, Zheng Chuiping not only refunded the full fee, but also provided compensation to the family members in China, supporting the livelihoods of the widows and orphans. This not only earned Zheng Kuiping a good reputation in the business, but also allowed her to evade immigration authorities time and again. Even if the police caught illegal immigrants, they remained steadfast, refusing to divulge any information about Zheng Kuiping. In this manner, Zheng Kuiping's business grew exponentially like a snowball rolling downhill. A few years later, she had become the top smuggler in New York, and even along the entire east coast of the United States, earning her the title of Mother of Snakeheads. The Fujianese-dominated gang, known as the Fuking Gang, also reaped huge profits. From the beginning, they were deeply tied to Zheng Kuiping's business, assisting in transporting migrants, collecting debts for smuggling fees, and even acting as enforcers for her underground money exchanges and gambling dens. In 1989, she spent $3 million to purchase an entire building on East Broadway in New York's Chinatown, primarily operating an underground money exchange. Due to the highly efficient lending and remittance services, as well as the lack of requirements for identity documents from customers, her business boomed from the outset. During its peak, it was said that Fujianese people throughout New York State borrowed money from her. However, even as her business grew larger, Zheng Kuiping still adhered to her own set of operational standards. 
For instance, she kept the number of people per smuggling operation under 10. Moreover, compared to other snakeheads, Zheng Kuiping's smuggling routes were complex and lengthy. Sometimes they had to pass through Southeast Asia, South America, and even Europe and Africa, taking almost a year to reach the United States. However, as her business expanded and she led more groups, inevitably, unexpected incidents arose. In January 1988, just a few hundred meters from Niagara Falls, the U.S. Border Patrol discovered an overturned small boat in a river channel. Following the traces of struggle along the shore, they found the frozen body of a young pregnant woman, a victim of the tragedy. Law enforcement strongly suspected that this unfortunate pregnant woman was an undocumented migrant attempting to enter the United States via Canada. No identification documents were found on the body, but police retrieved a scrap of paper from her pocket with a hastily scrawled New York State phone number and the name of a Chinese man with the surname Zhang. The owner of this number was none other than Zheng Chuiping's husband, Zhang Yide. When confronted by the police, Zhang claimed he was merely helping out in New York and knew nothing about smuggling operations. Despite continued questioning, Zhang adamantly refused to divulge any names. When the police were at a loss, Zheng Kuiping took the initiative to come forward with her lawyer. After negotiations, she took on the majority of the charges to protect her husband, securing his nine-month parole. Zheng Kuiping herself was sentenced to three months of parole. However, the lenient sentence was not without reason. According to later court disclosures, she had struck an internal agreement with the FBI, becoming an undercover informant for nearly five years, providing information about the Fuking Gang, a Chinese criminal organization. This collaboration brought Zheng Kuiping substantial profits and protection. During her cooperation with the FBI, her smuggling business flourished without interference from the government, and her reputation grew, with smuggling fees increasing from $18,000 to $40,000. On June 6, 1993, for those stranded aboard the cargo ship Golden Adventure, it marked the onset of a nightmare. The vessel carried 286 migrants, 90% from Fujian, China. After seven months at sea, navigating through Thailand and around the Cape of Good Hope in Africa, they finally reached the waters near New York City. However, the planned small boat to ferry them ashore failed to arrive. To evade detection by maritime patrols, everyone crowded into the filthy and cramped quarters, enduring two weeks without proper food or water. With no sight of land or rescue in sight, the crew, exhausted and desperate, steered into U.S. waters in the early hours of June 6th. As a nearby patrol boat closed in, the captain of the Golden Adventure, panicked, instructed the migrants to jump into the sea and flee towards the shore. Hours later, with daylight breaking, aided by the arriving New York police and the FBI, they apprehended the shivering migrants who had managed to swim ashore. Ten perished in the chaotic landing, and six went missing, presumed dead, while the remaining 270 were arrested. The tragic smuggling incident shocked the nation and prompted President Clinton, in his first year in office, to vow strict measures against the Golden Adventure incident. Consequently, Zheng Kuiping, dubbed the mother of snakeheads, was among those targeted. Though not the mastermind behind the event, as a major smuggler responsible for transporting over 3,000 migrants, she couldn't escape the crackdown. Realizing the formidable reach of the FBI wouldn't save her, Zheng Kuiping fled the United States, facing a global arrest warrant. In 1994, upon returning to mainland China, she resided in her hometown of Shengmei Village due to the lack of an extradition agreement between the U.S. and China. Over the next six years, she traveled between Hong Kong and Fujian using false identities, engaging in import-export businesses and even establishing a garment factory in Shenzhen. With her wealth, she made significant contributions to her hometown, funding infrastructure projects and building homes. As most of the village's youth had migrated to the U.S. through her connections, the village was left with mostly elderly and children, many of whom lacked proper documentation for schooling. Zheng Kuiping not only funded the construction of a nursing home, but also established a boarding school for these children. Consequently, in the eyes of her fellow villagers, Zheng Kuiping became a redeemer-like figure. Even decades later, volunteers continued to maintain her former residence in Shengmei village. However, the U.S. authorities persisted in their pursuit. In April 2000, acting on a tip-off, Hong Kong police arrested her at the airport. Due to the extradition agreement between the U.S. and Hong Kong, she was finally sent to the U.S. for trial in July 2003, nine years after the Golden Adventure incident. 
initially facing seven serious charges, including murder, unsafe transportation of illegal immigrants by sea, and running an underground money laundering operation. Zheng Kuiping was ultimately convicted by the federal court in Manhattan in March 2006 for conspiracy to smuggle, money laundering, and extortion against families of illegal immigrants, receiving a 35-year prison sentence. Eight years later, Zheng Kuiping passed away at the age of 65 due to advanced pancreatic cancer in a women's prison in Texas. Thus, there was the grand funeral attended by thousands of people, as mentioned at the beginning. Zheng Kuiping's life was full of contradictions. It's hard to label her as either a guiding angel to heaven or a demonic force to hell. Even more than a decade after her death, opinions about her remain divided. Lastly, there's a small story about the Golden Adventurer incident. Among the apprehended migrants was a craftsman named Yang, skilled in weaving. During their detention, Yang, with his adept hands, led his fellow detainees in crafting small handicrafts to pass the time and give them something to do. Unable to use scissors or similar items, they twisted toilet paper into fine strips and colored them with watercolor pens, weaving them into exquisite paper artworks that amazed the prison guards. Later, some of these paper artworks were taken out of the prison, causing a sensation. It is said that even in the office of President Clinton, there was a paper-made American bald eagle crafted by one of the migrants. Years later, after being pardoned, these individuals donated tens of thousands of handmade paper crafts to the Ellis Island Immigration Museum in New York. The museum dedicated a special exhibition commemorating the Golden Adventurer incident. Two items in particular attracted attention, a Statue of Liberty and a replica of the Golden Adventurer itself. These two items may be the most powerful depiction of the tragedy, carrying both pain and dreams, uncertain whether leading to heaven or hell.